Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Hope you can hear me well. Thank you for joining the second of our webinar series talking about the impact of the crisis across various uh, dimensions of the industry. Um, before I introduce our very exciting panelists today, I'd just like to have a vote of thanks to uh, the NHS workers and all the key workers who have been doing a tremendous job during this lockdown period in uh, um, helping us really stay sane through the, lock, through the lockdown. And, and uh, as I've always maintained, that the crisis is going to have three waves, uh, a health crisis, an economic or a financial crisis, and then a social crisis. As we take um, our very cautious steps to come out of the health crisis, I think it's time to uh, turn our minds to the economic crisis that is uh, looming and in front of all of us. And in the context of that, I'd like to introduce our panelists to you today. I'll lead with uh, Professor Viji Narayanan. Uh, Professor Dr. Viji Narayanan, or Viji as we all know him, is the chair of the MBA elective cur curriculum and the Thomas D. Cassidy, Junior Professor of Business Administration at the Harvard Business School. Uh, VG has been teaching at the Harvard Business School since 1994 and has uh, taught a number of courses in financial reporting and measuring and driving corporate performance. He's also on the board of a number of companies, including a large lender out of Boston. And so his insights into what's going to happen in the mortgage industry would be absolutely tremendous. Uh, second, we have Buster Tolfrey, who is the commercial director at United Trust Bank, a specialist lender in the UK. Uh, Buster has spent over 20 years in financial services management across various roles. Uh, he has experience in both origination and servicing, specifically in the mortgages and consumer lending sectors. And uh, I think his personal insights as to what will happen to the industry will be very exciting. So, so well, welcome to you, Buster. Last but not least, we have Tracy Bailey, who's the head of transformation at Together, with over 20 years of experience in specialist uh, lending. Uh, she's now responsible for the delivery of all strategic and tactical improvements at the lender. And she's leading the path in modernizing the lender in the, in the months and years to come. So her view as to how the industry has coped in the past and, and will cope in the future is going to be very exciting. Welcome, welcome once again to, to all the panelists. I'm going to just kick, kick this off by probably going first to you, Vijay, and just talk a little bit about, about the past. And, and, and you've, you've probably seen quite a few of these um, uh, crises in the past, but it'll be useful to hear your view on uh, how the industry has coped with crises in the past and what really, in your personal experience, have been some of the things that have set apart the winners from the also rands from previous uh, crisis. So uh, thank you, Arindam. And uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, people uh, both here in the US and UK, probably other parts of the world. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, there are some lessons we can learn from past crises, I think. Um, the world always changes and people that are looking at a crisis and seeing an opportunity, they are the ones who survive and do well. And uh, apologies, there's some police vehicle in the background. Um, and uh, we saw from the 2008 uh, crisis that uh, it really accelerated, at least in banking in the US and mortgage lending, really accelerated the trend, trend towards more going more digital, more online. And uh, those that were equipped for that benefited from that. And I think the same trend is going to continue now. Uh, if anything, um, you know, people that uh, were already thinking about moving more and more of the business online are the ones that are going to do well. And that trend is not going to change. But what is going to change is probably that they are where the population lives. Uh, there might be some de-densification of urban locations. And therefore, uh, banks and lenders who are more agile and nimble and willing to shift and go where their customers are moving to, they are the ones who I think are going to do better. 
the third thing I would identify, so technology is one, move where your customers are moving, second. And the third thing is uh, good old fashioned corporate governance. Uh, we saw that in the past companies that had been chasing the marginal return, excess return, uh, at the, and going outside their core competence uh, paid the price. I remember distinctly in 2008, we're sitting at this board meeting and one of my board members saying, you're not Federer or Nadal. And that got everyone's attention. Of course, I'm not Federer or Nadal. What are you talking about? It's like, I mean, it's happening roughly around the time of the Wimbledon. And uh, people saying, we don't have to chase the, you know, the sidelines and hit the perfect winner that hits the line every time. There's plenty of money in the middle. Uh, because we were getting all these, uh, you know, let's make this loan to this person from New Jersey who cannot document their income and who cannot give us all the documents, but the rates are very high and we can turn it around and sell it and we'll collect the fee income. And we were like, no, we don't understand the business. We're not going to do that business. And so the same good old fashioned corporate governance in terms of, you know, not trying to do something heroic in the last minute to try and buttress your financials, but you know, sticking to the core of what you understand well, I think is going to be important as well. So those are my three things that I think we can learn from past crises. Fantastic, I think Viji, thanks for that. So, tech, so technology, go where your customers are going and stay to, you know, stay, stay core to the business you really understand. And that plays well into, into Babasta, if I may just, just, just pass on the baton to you. I think being a specialist lender and, and, and having seen sort of all, all, all spectrum and Tracy, you can add to it. Uh, Babasta, your views on, on you know, how really the industry players uh, fared in, in the past? So I think there's, you know, there's a couple of things at play here. If you think back to, to 2008, we thought that happened quickly. Um, you know, at the time, it, you know, it seemed like every day there was one lender or, you know, pulling out of the market or someone changing something. And in reality, it happened over, a, you know, a period, a period of months, really, you know, back into 07 and into, into 08. Um, but actually, what, what's happened this time around, it was overnight. Um, so taking kind of UTB as an example, um, we, we were uh, done some, um, some prep in the run up to, to the UK lockdown, uh, making sure that we had enough people that could work from home and that sort of thing. And then we had um, a member of our, a member of staff, um, actually came into contact with someone with um, COVID-19 quite early on. Um, and so our reaction was to basically overnight have a whole department that, that didn't come into work the next day. So um, that was about a week before lockdown happened. And uh, that was a, you know, a really challenging environment because we had people who didn't have the right equipment. They didn't have you know, necessarily enough licenses or they didn't have, you know, they had um, you know, not the right PCs or laptops and that sort of stuff at home. So I think the speed at which, um, at which this has happened is, is the thing that sets it apart. You know, anybody who says their DR plans or their BCP plans were absolutely up to scratch ready for this eventuality is a liar as far as I'm concerned. Because, you know, to go from everyone being on site and then suddenly not having a, a backup site to go to, but still trying to, to, to operate was, was really challenging. I think I do agree with what Viji said in that, um, you know, the lenders that, that are probably fare the best are those that have got um, the most technology um, investment or certainly had their eyes open to the opportunities of technology earlier. I think what it's forced us to do um, is there was a number of things that we were, we were flirting with or we were kind of nearly, oh, we'll get to that next, next week or we'll get to that next quarter. Um, let's just get this out of the way first. You know, those sorts of things actually kind of hit us square in the face. And probably the biggest thing for for the mortgage division was that we went um, paperless pretty much overnight. Now, it wasn't an elegant solution because, you know, we didn't have time to make it elegant, but we did that overnight because we didn't have, a, have any choice. Um, we'd, we'd sort of soft launched a, a secure chat app as well. Um, and, and it really forced our hand in increasing the usage of that to kind of take away some of the telephone traffic. Um, so I do, I do think there is, is, is parallels to what happened in OA. I think we're more advanced in terms of digital solutions and, and more integrated systems, especially, you know, with both introducers or, or other, other suppliers. So I think, I think it, it does have similarities, but I don't, I wouldn't, you know, it's not a carbon copy. And I think, um, almost arguably back in OA, that was, came from the mortgage securities issues. This is a so social society issue. You know, we, um, 
we're not sure what the impacts of social distances, distancing is going to have for, year, for years to come. As a, but there's two things that I keep saying, I keep saying in the office, which is, um, you know, we used to see on TV all the crazy people in Japan on the, on the tube with their, with their face masks on. And, uh, and that's, that's us now, <laughs> you know, that's going to be us for the next couple of, you know, well, probably for, forever, um, you know, and also, uh, you know, big social gatherings, I, I, I just don't think are going to happen in the same way as they have before. You'll always have a group of people that don't care. You'll have a group in the middle that are, you know, want to be precautious. And then you'll have the group at the other end who just will never go to another football match or a gig ever again. Um, so I think that the impact here is more social and, and therefore arguably going to be longer term you know we might be out of the financial impact of COVID-19 in you know 18 months 24 months you know that I mean the, the, the tip of it sort of thing we'll be paying off the debt for a long long time but the social impact of people avoiding being more than two meters or you know, less than two meters apart in supermarkets or in restaurants I've, you know that's going to last for you know a generation you know it's, it may be something that doesn't go so i do think there's similarities but i also think there's differences you know excellent yeah i mean it's, it's I'll, I'll come around to the all the various suit so they're saying what's likely to happen to the industry going 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 forward from a growth standpoint but, but just rounding off this this round Tra tracy tracy you've uh, you've been part of an environment and a, and a, and a lender that's been um you know that's been around a long time seen a number of different crises um, and you're, you're now actively getting onto the technology transformation. But in the past, how are you know, some of the really uh, you know, keen techniques that, that you've seen worked? Tracy, do we still have you? So, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. I'm hoping you do because I'm do having some connectivity issues. Okay, yeah, we can hear you now, but I think your picture is frozen, unfortunately. So Yeah, we are having some connectivity issues here. Okay. Should we just come back to you then? Uh, do you want to try and dial back? Do you want to try and dial back in? And we'll come back to you. Yeah, come back to me. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, so maybe. I'll maybe, try and dial maybe, back in. Okay. Really, just just as a count as a counter to that, you know, if you if you if you see what what uh, you know the soothsayers are saying that the economy going forward is going to you know shrink anywhere between seven and ten percent in h1 and you know globally the G gdp growth is going to be uh, sort of uh, you know minus anywhere between minus two and four percent and just this morning there was something out from seaber here saying that house prices are going to you know fall by about 13 percent by the end of the year how do you deal with you know how how do lenders and how are you seeing lenders deal with this immediate issue leave alone the next 12 to 24 months the next three to four months how do you how are you seeing people cope so uh, i think la lenders learned some lessons from the 2008 crisis the first thing they went to, uh, went for was liquidity they made sure they had enough access to enough lines of credit that's done and I think the central bankers were also learned from the previous crisis. They made sure that liquidity access to the financial institutions is plentiful. So that's not been an issue this time. The second, at least in the US, the small business lending opportunity uh, has been good for the Main Street, but it's also been good for the bankers. And uh, so it's a sizable amount of loan. And here again, you saw the ones that were nimble and had the technology respond really fast. Uh, the day it was announced, midnight that day, 12 midnight, our bank was taking loans, processing the application. By 12.05, in five minutes, we had gotten so many applications. And we were helping everyone, whether they're our customers, not our customers. And many of the large banks in the US didn't respond that way. They, even after the program was announced for many, many days, they didn't look at this. Or when they went to it, they were like, only our customers first. I mean, they just, delayed things so much. And here were people that were hurting who needed the liquidity themselves and the government is making it available, yet the banks were not willing to step forward and play the role. So clearly small business lending is, was another, is another opportunity, was another opportunity. The third is refinancing. You know, uh, if life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. So the interest rates have dropped so much. There are a lot of people who needed to refinance. And so you 
make your mortgages to them and you turn around and you sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and you collect your fee income. And um, that has been an opportunity for bankers. So that's sort of what's going to tide us, I think, for the next three to four months before we start making sense of what the more changes in customer behavior. Um, right now, I don't think anyone is moving. No one is selling homes. No one is buying homes. No one is... Uh, giving up any rental uh, apartments and flats to do anything. So it's just like in a log jam. So you just have to tide over the next three to four months, uh, start making some provisions for bad debts because you know that's coming. And, uh, but you have to start planning for what could be coming three to six months uh, from now. I think we all survive on hope and uh, analysis paralysis is what we have to avoid. And you will see some beacons of light here and there and start planning for those and make those opportunities. And we'll get through this one as well. I think that's right. It's a kind of the next, next three or four months is, is all about a holding pattern almost, you know, um, from a, from a, you know, a UK perspective, we've got somewhere between one in four and one in five of all um, customers on a mortgage payment holiday. So, you know, that announcement went out from the treasury. Um, it, there was no, you know, precursor. There was no warning that came from, you know, the regulators or that came from the trade bodies. You know, it was the announcement on TV. Now suddenly you're getting tens of thousands of telephone calls. And I think, you know, that, that day one, that was probably for a lot of lenders, the, the biggest challenge, especially in an environment when you've suddenly got all of your servicing staff working from home. Um, uh, or if they're, you know, um, offshored or, or outsourced services, then, then, then they've got sort of the effect is multiplied. So I think, you know, the first three or four months or the next three or four months, we, we'll, we'll understand a lot more about um, payment holidays, how um, customers are going to come out of those payment holidays. One of the things that we're spending quite a lot of time on is modeling what we believe the arrears ratios will be out of those payment holidays. Um, so obviously we've got a lot of people in financial difficulty that have been furloughed or taken cuts in income, that sort of thing. Um, but not one in four people has been, been furloughed in the UK. Um, so there, there will be a slug of those people that have taken payment holidays, you know, as a, almost like an insurance policy. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So I'd rather have a little bit more safety net in the bank. Thank you. Um, you know, if, if, it, if things go okay or, 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 or that household perhaps doesn't have the challenges they were expecting, then, you know, they, 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 they'll continue to pay. But for those people that end up taking a pay cut or, or are rope made redundant or, you know, you know, self-employed that see drop, drops in turnover or whatever it might be, um, you know, there's going to be an increase in arrears. And, um, and I think kind of preparing now for what that looks like is, is important. Um, I know that's not the origination side, but, but that's equally as important. Um, and certainly a lot of the treatments that came out of, of, of the credit crunch, uh, you know, things like capitalization or, you know, extending the term, things like that are things that we're, you know, you know we and, and, and other lenders obviously are, are, are very, Cognizant of. Absolutely, and I'm going to go, go over to Tracy because you, you Tracy, you're, you're hopefully you're back. You I'm back. Me. Okay, well, wonderful. So, 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 I guess together is a slightly different kind of lender. You, you've been around a long time, and and interestingly, over the lockdown period, you stopped lending. Uh, any lessons? So, so we've heard about you know technology, about nimbleness, about you know, thinking about what, um, uh, you know, what all the Sybils and Bibbles loan is going to do to commercial lending or, uh, you know, all of the furlough schemes are going to do to personal. But from your lending stand standpoint, any, any other sort of dimensions that you're dealing with? So I think there's two things. Obviously, I was going to talk to you earlier about how compared to the earlier recession in 2008. Obviously, that was, you know, the implosion of the subprime market. And for us as a lender at that time, Similar to what Buster said, you know, literally on a day by day basis, we got a warning as lenders pulled out of the market, you know, and were taking away products, taking away all lending at the time. And fortunately for us, we were in a, a stronger position at that time that we literally just secured a refinance. So we were there at the time of that 2008 recession and able to continue to lend and lend effectively, albeit prudently. This has been slightly different because clearly, what came first this time was actually the social crisis. So the, the virus and the pandemic has been the key driver. And at the point in time where we decided to stop taking new applications was really when we knew that we had to focus on our existing customers. So to, to Buster's point, whilst origination is important, actually looking out for the existing customers, making way for the payment holidays, 
And yes, at the moment, we're waiting with bated breath to see if they're extended by the government. And obviously, who knows what impact that could have. We already know that with the October furlough, that is going to extend what that looks like. And we're like probably most of the lenders are busy working out, out how customers are going to exit these payment holidays. Um, so I don't think I've got any different sort of like angle to give you. But in terms of resilience, you know, keeping to our core business, which is what we did in 08, and then this time being more prudent while we watch and understand the market is is the key thing for us to continue really um and obviously with yesterday's announcement from the government that the um the house buying market is now moving again we're starting to see the pipeline applications coming through but i would expect you know there'll be a lot of deals that have been lost through this lockdown period there'll be people whose circumstances have changed so what that looks for like as lenders now will be a merge over the next two or three um months i think I think we've sort of we spoke a little bit about lenders and and, con, and consumers and um, one of the somebody asked a question but it's actually a really valid point like you know when you think about the broker market and um, you know we as lenders we've got the joy of of residual interest income sat on the balance sheet with you know an income stream and and actually not necessarily all lenders of uh, uh, sorry brokers don't have that introducers don't have that so I think you know, we've done what we needed to do to protect our businesses. It's not necessarily the loans that we write today that's the risk. It's the loans that we wrote a year, two years, three years, four years. They're the, they're the ones that, that we'll pay for, you know, if, you know, over the next year or two. Um, but I think we need to be, you know, it's difficult for, for brokers, you know, a lot of them have furloughed staff. And, and we, I could see a situation where we have an appetite to lend. As a community of lenders, I mean, not just UTB, yeah. as a community of lenders, we have an appetite to lend. Um, but we find out that, that actually because um you know the the market isn't there the conversion isn't there that valuers might, might be willing to walk into a house with a hazmat suit but i'm not sure mr smith wants them in if they were in a care home that morning you know so there's a you know there's a sort of a two-way street on the valuations front i think and you know i'm i am one of the one of the risks that we've identified is that the, the change in dis distribution could be quite high over the next couple of years if we're not you know if we're not careful, you know, we won't necessarily have this V bounce back, but if the bounce, if the bounce for one of a better phrase is, is a longer thing and takes into you know, longer into next year or beyond, then it could end up being quite a long recovery because you, you know, as lenders, we won't have the, the distribution that we, we maybe had before, especially those of us that don't have direct propositions, us, us include UTB included. So, um, so I think we do need to think about it kind of from a consumer lender and, and that middle introducer point of view, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, at least we've got interest income. They, they haven't, you know. I don't know. What do you yeah. think about that, Trace? Do you think that's... Yeah, I agree. So obviously the, the, the business model of the intermediary is far different from the lender, as we know. And I think, you know, getting that distribution right and getting back into the market is going to be a key thing. Just coming back to your valuation point as well, Buster, I think there's, a, there's a, another risk around that. Um, you know, I've been contacted in the last few days by surveying firms who are asking about appetite to lend, return to market etc because obviously a lot of surveyors are furloughed at the moment so mm. as much as um rics are saying that you know the, the surveyors are back and coming into back into the market these these surveying firms have also got a decision to make about who they unfurlough and how quickly they unfurlough as well but if you consider in the uk you know um surveyors you know are, are probably older in terms of age and these people are more likely to be you know sheltering shielding um, may not be able to come back into work. So I think distribution around valuation is going to be, you know, limited. But in addition to that, you know, we've also then got who is actually going to predict what that market's going to do when we go into that, mm. that bounce back and then how far is it going to come down? Um, I've seen varying figures today between 13% and 5% drop, depending on who you sort of like reading about. So I think it's going to be a, a tricky one, really. And I think intermediaries, coming back to original point, are going to have to bear with us as lenders and we're going to have to try and support them as much as we can to offer originations where we can mm. but also to make sure that we safeguard and keep ourselves in the market for longer yeah absolutely that, that's an interesting one just just bringing in a different di dimension to it and, and and you know adding adding the u.s dimension to it so kelly you know from our standpoint uh, you know the use of digital the use of ai is actually tremendously increasing there's an increased appetite for for uh, the lenders and brokers to use our products. But are you expecting, and, and maybe I'll go, go to Vijay on this, this one, if you see the structure of the market, 
between the US and the UK. I think the UK, uh, we don't have the quick and loads, although we, we are seeing the habitos and the thresholds and the, you know, the online lenders increasing. It's nowhere as sort of rapid or as dominant as a quick in, in the U, U, US. With the increase of digital, are you expecting, and, and you know, first to VG and then back to the, to, to, to the U, UK, uh, a change in the structure as in more direct to, con, to consumer, or more direct borrower channel um, uh, for volume as opposed to going, going through the brokers? Um, I don't know about that. I think what will happen is end to end, it's going to become digital. Uh, even like a few years ago, you needed to meet with an attorney who would say, sign here, sign there. They had to take it to the city and in the U.S. and get the mortgage deed registered. It had to be done in person or by mail. Now people are asking the question, why do you have to meet any human being to do this? From the time you, you know, you know, you like the house, that part you might have to go physically go inspect. So even now, a lot of people are checking out homes online and I'm told the people buying homes sight unseen only because they've taken the virtual tour and they're like, okay, I like it, I'll take it. So uh, any element which was physical, I think is going to get taken out of the supply chain and not everyone is going to be able to adapt to it that quickly. So if you want an appraisal done on a property and someone can do it completely digitally without having physically gone and checked there, that's a big paradigm shift for many people, but that's where we are headed, I think. And, uh, how will this affect the banks versus the intermediaries or brokers? Depends on who's going to be more nimble. I think this is a market that's waiting to be grabbed and whoever is willing to do those extra value added services completely digitally is going to do better. So it's, I, at this stage, I can't tell you who's going to grab it. I think uh, either party can. Uh, Trace, any, any thoughts? And I'll come, come back to last year. Yeah, definitely. So I, I agree with you, Vijay, that there is a huge market there waiting to be grabbed. And we're starting to see some um, people who are being innovative enough to actually come into this digital space. You're right, being able to do a virtual walk around the property is going to be appealing for a lot of people, um, you know, in terms of the social distancing piece. And then clearly, you know, being able to digitally value and, you know, stop, the, stop sort of like the holdups in terms of the chain is going to be hugely beneficial. So I think if there is opportunities out there, I'm seeing them, then, you know, those um, surveyors that take those opportunities are going to be winning hands down, really. Um, I've already seen, you know, some release this week around about um, insurance backed AVM models, which, you know, are key for lenders, whether specialist or high street, um, particularly with not being able to predict what property prices is going to do. And, you know, apart from it adding value to the customer's application journey, it adds massive value to the lender security as well. So I think there's absolutely room for growth in this area. And if one thing comes out of, you know, this particular situation we found ourselves in, I think digitalizing valuations is got to be something that we move forward with. I, t I mean, I, I, to be honest, I don't have a lot more to, to add beyond that, you know, um, a lot of, I, I guess the only, the only, the only thing to think about is a lot of PTs, so product transfers where someone's taking a, a, a refinance but staying with the same lender tends to happen on, on an AVM basis. Um, probably a big area of the market that hasn't been um, explored for AVMs is, um, is buy-to-lets. So there's still quite a heavy reliance on, on full internal valuations. And, um, you know, there are, there are models out there for, for, for buy-to-let properties and, and rental incomes, um, but they're, they're not as prevalent as they are on the residential side. Um, if you, if you do factor in the kind of AVM, not necessarily a desktop valuation by an actual value, but an, an AVM, you, you kind of combine that with some of the technology that lenders like Atom are, are, you know, or Barclays are, are sort of introducing now where you know, it's your day one approval and you've got you know, income verification built in and you can go AVM. Actually, you can see a world where you get to a, you know, a pretty quick mortgage offer, um, maybe with some other, like Trace said, some other you know, insurances that, that aren't well used or, or don't exist today um, to, to kind of get you to that point. I think it's still going to grind to a halt when it hits the solicitors because that market is not digitized in any way, shape or form. Um, but, you know, hey, if you look at the changes in the, you know, in the mortgage market in the last sort of 20 years, when it, or, you know, and then you go 
probably go back 30 years and you had to go in and get interviewed by your bank manager and wear your best suit and tie to get a mortgage. And now look where we are. And actually, if we can continue to make those sort of advancements forwards throughout the life cycle, then, then that's got to be good for everybody. Um, you know, that's, that's got to be good for everybody, I think. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, 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 that's it. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Great. I mean, so, so moving on to a slightly different di dimension of this, and that's the, so that's the servicing and the securitization market. And um, obviously the markets are closed for as of now. And also there's a tremendous amount of government funding that's coming in, which is, which is having uh, sort of some kind of impact on commercial cash flows. And I think the furlough scheme is having some kind of impact on individual or residential cash, cash, cash flows. But equally, we're seeing a tremendous increase in the request for payment holidays. And like Buster, you were saying earlier, you know, there is now talk that you know there may be an a, you know an even further increase in the duration. Do you see? And, and Buster, coming to you first, do you see a change in the kind of product portfolios? that lenders are going to start uh, sort of pushing out into the market to be able to sort of uh, deal, deal with this anomaly? Uh, what, in terms of the payment holiday feature? And, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the other, other gov, 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 government back schemes. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it was a bit <laughs> a smile because yes, yesterday it was a bit like payment holiday bingo. We, uh, there was a press release that went out saying, it's going to be October, then uh, half an hour later, it's, it's 12 months and then, that afternoon, it's 18 months, you know, the press are, are loving this, uh, this payment holiday bingo. But I think in reality, it will go to the end of October. Um, you know, it'll match the furlough. I, I, I don't see any reason why, why that won't be the case. Um, you know, the reality is this is an anomalous situation. This is kind of a recession and a, and a period of, of challenge that hasn't been brought about in the same way as other financial crises has in the past. This is, this is a, you know, a virus. It's a it's a pandemic it's not been driven by irresponsible lending it's actually been driven by something that that you, you can't really underwrite to um so you know the guidance that we've been given is that we shouldn't discriminate against people that have had a payment holiday uh in the past um you know would i lend to somebody today that's currently on a payment holiday then the answer to that is, is probably no because it suggests financial difficulty or they've taken that payment holiday for a reason um, but coming out of the back, back of it, um, providing their income is sustainable and the loan is affordable, then, then you know, we wouldn't discriminate against that. And that's certainly the guidance that we've seen. I think furlough income is slightly different. Um, you know, if you've already exchanged on a, on a purchase or a transaction um, and then been put on furlough, I think, I think that's a scenario where my personal opinion is you should proceed with the transaction, um, given that there's been a commitment made fr from exchange. I think if it's pre-offer though, um, you know, each lender will have a different risk-based view. My, uh, my view is that um, we're not currently um, progressing applications where someone's on furlough. I think it, you know, whilst I hope for those people, they, they come out fine. It, it is an indicator about the stability of business, um, you know, especially, and you've seen a lot of lenders make changes in leisure, retail, entertainment, those, those sorts of things. Um, so, so, you know, I think by and large, lenders will take a, a pragmatic view. Um, but, um, but there are obviously cash flow um, considerations. So, um, you know, you, you're accruing your interest income, but that's really wooden dollars if, if, if customers aren't physically paying. And um, I think the longer it goes on, um, you know, you may, you may start to see some, some lenders that, that start to encounter, encounter challenges. Um, but by and large, I think this is a, you know, this is a probably a, another four to six months, I don't know, Maybe Q1, we're thinking we get back to some sense of normality with more people together in an office and that sort of thing. I think the recovery for a lot of pubs, restaurants and places like that will, will be longer and not all of them will, will survive it through. But I think lenders have learned a lot of lessons from you know, lending that took place 10, 15 years ago. You, know, you just think about the, the regulatory requirements of stress testing and affordability testing and all of those sorts of things. Um, you will see an increase in arrears because it's inevitable, but it will be nothing like if we'd have hit this in 2006, for example, you know, it will be a very, very different, um, very different landscape, you know. Trace, just, just talking a bit about, you know, the, the sort of the immediate coping stra strategies and, and, and I think Buster and our pre-conference pre, uh, chat was talking about some of the 
some of the operational challenges coming back onto onto full stream of operations now. And we know that that a large part your of your organization has been fur furloughed. Being able to come back and and sort of bring it back into sort of full stream operations. Are you seeing any strategies or techniques which which will help uh, sort of come back into normal operations quicker than others? So um, from, a, from a customer operations perspective and servicing customers, we've got a you know, our full complement of advisors and more who've been redeployed helping our customers from home. Um, and you know, that has brought you know, just some very, very small uh, technology challenges, but actually you know, we managed within a like, two week period to get the vast majority of our colleagues out and safe at home. So I think we had 90% out within two weeks and everybody is still working from home. Um, and, you know, apart from remote QA to make sure that customer outcomes are clear uh, and are good, that, that isn't really posing any significant challenges for us at the moment. Apart from obviously maintaining our colleagues' health and well-being and, you know, emotional connection to the business. Um, we have got colleagues on furlough because clearly not every part of the business is able to operate as it would functionally at the minute. But, you know, we'll take advantage of that until we can, can bring them back into the business. Getting ready for operations, that's, that's a challenge just because of the, the, the total piece around social distancing. So, you know, um, we have two buildings at our head office. Um, fortunately, most of our colleagues travel already by car because of its location. So we don't have the issues around public transport, but we do still have the same challenges as everybody else in terms of, you know, those that were children, those that are already shielding. So, and then it's how to operate on a one-way system throughout the buildings. How do we keep colleagues um, spaced apart? So whether or not we carry on with some level of homework in to make sure we can um, support our customers is one thing, but actually from an operational perspective, I don't think we've got any sort of real challenges other than like anybody else to get back into the workplace altogether. Um, so, and I can't imagine that's gonna be, you know, anytime soon. Um, before we get into sort of Q3, Q4 on a, on, a, on a mass basis. Absolutely. One of the, we were joking around just before the call, but we're on the 28th floor and, uh, you know, the queues just in the lifts could be an absolute nightmare. Um, but, you know, those, those, those things are crazy. I mean, who'd have thought we'd be talking about having traffic light systems on toilets, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. Absolutely. All right, great. Let's uh, let's m move on now. I, I think we're, we're get, getting towards the end of the sort of the formal discussion, uh, you know, part part of the con conference, and, and there are a few questions popping up in the Q and A box. But let me go go to Vijay. So Vijay, if you if you were to cast your mind over the next twelve to twenty four months, you know, what in your mind would be sort of the top three challenges that lenders will need to overcome, and and you know, your top three sort of solutions to it so um i think it's going to be very geographic and geography geography specific uh boston is a university town and uh you know universities large number of them i mean in the past in boston is university and healthcare those are our two main industries we almost operate under the assumption that these are recession proof people always need an education they're always going to fall sick you know, so we are recession proof. We never thought about the pandemic. And mm. this has hit us really hard. Our students are not coming back to campus uh, that quickly. And many, there are 140 universities and colleges in the Boston area. Many of them will go bankrupt if the tuition dollars don't come in. International travel and an administration that's not favorably disposed towards visitors in the first place. Uh, our university economics for all the, except for the really wealthy ones are gonna be really badly hit. Uh, hotels and airlines are going to be badly hit because they're not bringing people here and people are not coming for graduation, staying behind, all of that. And healthcare, even though this is a healthcare emergency, anything other than COVID, people have been putting off. Any elective surgeries, if it's not really an emergency. So you have a bizarre situation where hospitals have, you know, need more capacity to handle the COVID patients, but everything else in the hospital is running with like zero revenues coming in. So what does this mean? Uh, people will not need the apartments around the universities. The, the hospitals may not need the apartments around those hospitals. And so those landlords are going to be struggling. 
And uh, we think many in the idea of de-densification of campuses and urban neighborhoods and tall buildings, people are going to move to the suburbs or those that are in the suburbs would have made the shift to urban areas. They're not going to downsize. They're going to hold on to their larger suburban apartments for longer. So what does this mean for lenders? I think the opportunity here is you have to move to the suburbs. You can't, uh, you know, or even in offices, they're going to be like, let's work with 50% utilization. Every, people come in every other day or let's open a satellite center in one of the suburbs. This is how I think businesses are going to think about it. And as lenders, you just have to be, you know, one step ahead and think like, what are the needs of my customers? What am I seeing as the leading trends of the most innovative customers? Others are going to copy that. Uh, the sec second thing I would suggest is um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to solve the whole thing. Uh, countries like Taiwan, Hong Kong, they're further ahead and uh, they seem to be managing this pretty well. Next up is Germany and even Italy and Spain are further ahead. So we can look to see where they are. You might get a lead of like a couple of months and that may be very important, those one or two months to figure out, okay, what are the implications for us in the UK or in your case or, or for us in the US? Uh, we probably look to you in the UK. We, I think you guys are a few weeks ahead of us in the whole pandemic, but also your response and innovations. And so that's the other thing I would suggest is uh, look where you think people are being innovative or hit first with this and how are they responding. We can't take it completely, but we'll have to say, oh, this is how we'll adapt it for our situation, but that's probably what's going to happen. My broader sense is that except for certain niche industries, a lot of it is going to come back fairly quickly in the next three, four months. Um, this is too early to tell that people say talk about a second wave, but I don't see the heavens falling in countries that have opened up. And I suspect something like that in stages will happen in the rest of the world, but they're going to be niches that like, you know, if you're Las Vegas, am I going there for a uh, yeah, casino visit right now in the middle of the pandemic? Probably not. So those kind of niche industries, niche geographies are going to be harder hit they're going to take a longer time to recover, but the bulk of it is probably going to not come back to normal, but 80% of the people will be making their payments, will be able to you know, get past this forgiveness period or payment holiday period and start resuming payments. That's the, not just the optimist in me, but also the most likely scenario, I think. So uh, the, it's the people that are in very badly affected areas that need to start thinking ahead. I think Boston might be one of those. Wonderful, and I think that that uh, you know talks a lot. And I'll come 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 to you, Buster. But you, you know, there. So as we we really saying, trying to understand you know where your customers and your you know your prime customer segments are moving and how they like you to behave. I think it's a big one, and and, and we're already helping in in other industries, putting in tech technology to predict how that segment segment is like is likely to behave. But one of the arguments that uh, you know, has been put for, forward is that this crisis has put everybody at ground zero. So everybody is starting from scratch and there's an opportunity to gain market share and even segments and product segments which you didn't have. Any reactions to how you would sort of win over the next 12 to 24 months? So, um, so I mean, speaking of, uh, as UTB, you know, we've got... Um, a presence in a number of different markets, uh, lending markets, so development finance, bridging, asset, um, motor, and, and obviously mortgages. Um, what we've seen is um, is as some lenders have, have, have exited, mainly warehouse line funded lenders who, who obviously haven't got the liquidity that, that retail banks have, can't go to necessarily to capital markets like they could have before, whereas we can raise funds um, you know, through, through customer deposits. Um, you know the, the the playing field is not as as crowded as it was you know three months ago two months ago um so kind of in some of our product sets we've seen a 400 percent increase in market share now that sounds amazing doesn't it um but sadly the market's also dropped 90 percent <laughs> so so you know the um the upside isn't isn't quite as strong as you know as it would be if the, if it if the market hadn't hadn't taken a real battering as well and obviously with a much different um, credit appetite, you know, retail banks are, are not, uh, you know, by and large, not lending at, you know, uh, over 75% LTV or 
you know, essentially have taken a 15% cut on any other type of products like Dev or, or Bridging. Um, that said, obviously, market share has gone up. Um, when brokers start to come back, there's probably going to be a period of time um, where the capital markets won't have reopened sufficiently for some of those lenders to come back. Um, and there'll be an opportunity for some retail banks who have got the appetite um, to, to maintain some of that, some of that market share. Um, so, uh, you know, there is opportunity in all of that. I think if you have a compelling proposition, there'll always be a place for you at the table, um, regardless of where your funding line is. Um, but it is hard as a new entrant. You know, we, we were new entrant to mortgage, mortgage market five years ago. Um, and it was, it was tough to get a seat at the table um, because you've got incumbents, you've got people that are um, like the process, familiar with the ones they already deal with, that, all of that sort, sort of stuff. Um, it certainly won't be like being a new entrant, you know, in a few months time when some of those other lenders start to, to, to re-enter. But it also won't be easy because there'll be an element of, well, now we're used to this other thing and we have these relationships and that sort of stuff. Um, but I'll, I'll come back to it. It's all, about the, it's all about the proposition. If you've got a strong enough proposition and you've got a compelling enough range of products, and I'm not just saying, you know, are my interest rates 15 bits cheaper than the next one? So come to me. I'm talking about the actual you know, the journey, the, the relationship, all of that sort of stuff, then, then I think there'll always, be a, there'll always be a place. But unequivocally, you know, it's been an easier ride for some of the retail banks, comparatively easier ride for some of the banks than it has for some, some warehouse line lenders. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of friends that work across the industry. And, um, you, know, you know, we want those, pe those firms to come back. We want those lenders in the market because, um, you know, UTB has, this is the market. UTB wants to do this bit. So you need lenders who have different credit appetites to span the spectrum, the whole you know, rainbow of lending, um, or, or otherwise you won't have the distribution. So you know, I, I welcome the day when some of, those, some of those firms start coming back because it signals that we're gonna have market growth and ultimately you know, whatever share that UTB writes within, within any of the markets we operate in, um, that, that, that percentage may go down, but the volume may go up because you're, you're actually growing out the, the, the number of eligible customers and, and, and the distribution. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, d different challenges based upon where your funding lines are, um, I think has been a, been a big thing. Um, but um, I, I certainly don't look at it and sort of rub my hands with glee, at, you know, the fact that our market share is kind of, I'm, I'm more concerned about, you know, the 12 month horizon and what, what does the market look like then? Um, in the product sets that, that we offer. Um, that's just my, you know, my personal view. Sean, Tracy, you, you've, uh, you know, so uh, together as lenders seen tremendous growth. I think you've, you've grown your loan book almost fourfold over, over, the last few, over the last few years. As you see the restart, you know, what messages and what lessons to the industry to to sort of replicate a similar growth, growth story so i think if i take us back to 08 when we were in a similar position to where utb are today where we have market share um and we were desperate for other lenders to come back into that market to to get that um growth going again and that, so I, I echo Buster's thoughts about that the quicker everybody can start lending again, the better for that um, market, for the intermediary market, for the customer base. I think just coming back to, to that particular point though, there's a couple of challenges for me. One is, um, you know, we have got this point about the furlough and the potential for redundancies and high unemployment, which, you know, are gonna be a challenge to anybody who's underwriting in the foreseeable coming few months around sustainability and about, you know, people's affordability moving forwards. I think if there's something to learn, um, two things for me. One is I think lenders have learned to work in whole new ways in the last few weeks. Um, and not just lenders, but everybody in that value chain for a mortgage. So your lenders, your valuers and your solicitors have all been working remotely, electronically. And I think we need to keep those habits up. Um, you know, it's now possible to have a face-to-face -face interview for a mortgage um, in terms of a remote access. So, you know, no longer having to go and sit down with your mortgage advisor. They've been carried out successfully online and lenders have accepted them. That needs to be maintained. And I think if there's two things for me is the hard reset for making that customer journey better. We're certainly going to take the opportunity to try and innovate as much as we can. Um, we have a very wide product set, as the industry knows. 
everything from residential first charge mortgages through to buy to let development and commercial and we want to basically align as much as we can to make that customer journey better to improve our proposition um, and I think that in turn then gives other lenders sort of that lead on what they can do as well so I think there's a, a couple of things in there but I would urge the industry to you know keep going with what they've learned and not slip back into old ways and then look for the other ways that they can innovate and automate that customer journey and the process as we move on. Fantastic. I think we're getting close to the end, end of the, the, the call here, of the hour here. So, so just before I go into, into the Q&A, and, and there's a number of them there, you know, some of the things that, that, that we are seeing from, a, from an AI and a, tech, and a technology standpoint, we're calling this the intelligent digital at scale. So, you know, most lenders are starting to go di digital, but, but it's not, not just dumb digital as, uh, as we saw in the previous five years. It's, you know, how do you add the intelligence into it? And then how do you do it at scale? How do you do it with, you know, tens and thousands of brokers and, and millions of customers? There are some very, very interesting trends out there as, as to what, you know, players like uh, Google and Facebook and Microsoft are doing to do intelligent digital at scale. And I'm sure a lot of those uh, lessons are going to trickle into the mortgage industry. Right. I think that was uh, that was very very useful. We have a number of questions out here, and I'm I'm going to take uh, probably probably point the first one to you, Tracy. Maybe this is about uh, you know everybody's talking about the digital journey, but obviously there's a segment of customers out there. These are the vulnerable and people who are not very very. Uh, you know, digital friendly. How do you deal with that challenge? Any thoughts and ideas? Any sort of questions? So this is a challenge that we're debating quite heavily at the minute at our table because actually there is still a sector of customers that are sitting in this category which aren't uh, tech savvy or maybe more vulnerable or just don't have access to online facility. So I think you've got to look on the basis of the fact of an 80-20 rule. So you try and design most of the processes, use artificial intelligence where you can, automate what you can for the majority of the customers, but actually you've still got to have that fallback for those customers that need to access finance, but can't actually do it in an online or aggregated way. So um, I think you've still got to build that into some form of business model. I think the majority of the world will probably be more tech savvy after this. Um, absolutely. You know, I know from personal experience, you know, we're now holding regular family Zoom nights. You know, we're interacting in ways we never did before. And I'm sure other families are doing the same. So there is that opportunity there that people will be more tech savvy. But I think you've got to maintain that point that there is other sectors that may not be quite as much. And you've still got to keep in your business proposition them in mind. Wonderful. Uh, Vijay, uh, so really, let me just point this out, out to you. So, so you, I think all, all three of you spoke about uh, trying to use technology, trying to stay close to customers, the, your customer segments, but are there any one or two pockets of growth that, you know, at a, at a global level, not just the US, US, UK, or other markets that you would think would be particularly uh, sort of attractive from a mortgage lending st standpoint? Oh, that's difficult. Uh, we're not seeing any deals. Uh, we are in holding pattern right now. So uh, it's very difficult to see the uh, pockets of growth from mortgage lending. Look, I think uh, at least in the U.S., I don't see the, uh, uh, I see in three, six months, the purchase market will come back and the, the refinance market will tide us over from now till then. So I don't see uh, dramatic changes. I mentioned earlier that I think the where we lend might shift and uh, categories that have historically done well may get hurt this time. It's their turn and it is completely unforeseen, I think, uh, particularly around university housing and things. But and I, I also see other areas of growth. For instance, fintech companies might get a banking license. And so we might see a lot more fintech companies morphing into banks. And, uh, and any, any recession, there's always consolidation that's going to happen. But beyond that, I don't know. I'm not able to read the tea leaves and tell you, look at this particular sector. These are all the employees who work for Zoom. They all need two houses now. Let's go lend to them. I can make those predictions for you. 
Bhaskar, any any closing any closing points on other than tech other than technology, the one thing that you would really focus on or ask the industry to focus on? Um, thanks. Cool, okay. Um, you know, some 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 kind of product sets that we haven't seen um, a whole lot of is um, you know things like um, purchasing, but where there's um, a number of people wanting to to kind of share the load on the mortgage. You know, so things like um, shared ownership, or, or, uh, almost the flavour of shared ownership, but where there's more than two or three applicants. I think you know one opportunity that exists in the Far East that that is just totally unheard of in the UK is almost like generational lending where your mortgage is sort of passed on from one, um, one family to another. I, I think one of the things, one of the product sets that we looked at last year and, 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 um, and kind of are currently monitoring was equity release. Um, ironically, equity release has gone through the roof uh, <laughs> since COVID-19 started. So happy days if you're, if you're in that market. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, it's, I think it's difficult to, 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 to estimate that from a product perspective. Um, you know, a lot of the firms that are doing well are, are, are those tech firms. And, and even in, you know, think people like Disney Plus, what a great time to launch. You know, all of those sorts of things are, uh, are good. But from a mortgage lending point of view, I think continuing to, um, to look at, uh, you know, our wish list of things. And actually, when we, when we do get back to some normality, not put stuff off. If we think there's a value add, then actually let's just go and do it because um, delaying, you know, as, as this has taught us, is, is probably not in our best interest in the long run. But, um, but no, from a product point of view, other than, other than what I mentioned, I, I, think, I think that's it really. Um, one thing it has taught me just from a communications perspective is I used to get really annoyed when people would want to set up like Zoom or, or Google Meet or Google Hangout, whatever type, type meetings. I, I actually think that was quite rude and yeah. or just come to the office or I'll come to you or, you know, that's how you do it. Um, but I'm a total convert now. You know, I'm not saying I won't, I won't get on the train and go, you know, and see, see, you know, partners or cu or customers or whatever. Um, still, of course, I will. But um, but it might not be at the same regularity as before. I think the way that we communicate has has changed forever. I I, I don't see that. I don't see that going back. Um, you know, I, I just don't. You look at this. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> you know, it's um, it's a great yeah. example. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Buster. And, and, and yeah, just, just to support a data point, we will put the data in data point. There was a recent article from McKinsey Research Institute saying, saying that across the world, business leaders are now twice as open to fast tracking digital programs through in the US and UK and about 1.5 times as, as, uh, as, as open in emerging markets like India, China. China. Tr Tracy, last, last word other than Technology, any any one area that that you 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 would like the lenders to focus on? Um, no, I don't think I've got anything else to add really. Um, I think it's just going to be a case of, and I hope that the the lending population does do this is still continue with caution, but give you know the customer really good outcomes, um, and make sure that you know we can serve the customers where possible. But, you know, just make sure that we, we watch the market all together uh, and ensure that we have a safe return and a safe way through this, what is going to be, you know, uh, an unprecedented few months to come and possibly even, you know, longer. Fantastic. Thank you all. I think that's been a wonderful one hour. Unfortunately, all good things must, must, come, must come to an end. So, so we are at the end of the hour, hour here. Uh, thanks again. To all of the attendees, uh, we're going to shortly post a Q&A, or if you could just provide your feedback on how useful you found the discussion to be, uh, I think that'd be very valuable. I don't know, Shani, are you able to do this? Uh, yeah, so if you could just take one minute to click on whether you found the conversation and the content useful, I think it'll certainly help us fine tune discussions going forward. Uh, I'm going to do mine and submit, okay. And uh, one final word, so, uh, so thank you again uh, for our next Thursday. We are gonna focus, again, have a very similar conversation, but on a slightly different uh, part of the market that Digitalytics fo focuses on. We're gonna look at you know, the SME learning market and, and, uh, and what uh, strategies may be there. We have uh, two CEOs and potentially a third CEO who's going to join join us. We're very 
uh, focused on uh, SME to lending and the big impact of all of the government back loans. Uh, one of the CEOs was saying that, you know, SME lenders have basically become a public distribution system for government back loans. So um, if you are interested and you think this talk is going to be in interesting, please join us back next Thursday.